Well, while they're waiting, or while we're waiting for everyone, um, I'd just like to say welcome, good morning. Um, my name is Carlton Hall. I'm with Carlton Hall Consulting, but I have the great, great privilege of working with a number of NGOs and CSOs uh, that are working in our field. And so it is my great privilege and pleasure to be here and to be a moderator for this event. So welcome, thank you so much for coming and thank you for your interest uh, in advancing effective strategies in the prevention, treatment, and recovery of women. Um, if you would allow me uh, to share a few facts. In the USA alone, according to the National Institute on Drug Abuse, in 2021, 26.6 million females aged 18 and over reported using illicit drugs in the past 12 months in the US alone. Research has found that there are many differences in how women and men use substances and react to substances. And hence the rationale for the conversation that we are going to have today, if we're looking forward to it. Access to treatment is horrifically challenging for everyone, but women often are challenged in ways that men are not. And so we need to be able to have a conversation around this. For example, many report being afraid to get help um, during or after pregnancy due to legal or social fears and the lack of childcare while in treatment is a huge concern, just as an example. These are merely a fraction of the concerns. We're going to have a video for you in just a little bit to provide a bit more context. Uh, but I could not be more honored to introduce to you four remarkable leaders uh, that I actually have an opportunity to uh, work with on several occasions and have an extraordinary amount of respect for. Uh, I am sitting next to four heroes of mine and I will share that with you in a bit. Uh, they will be offering their expertise uh, and unique perspectives on um, uh, this very important topic of discussion um, and helping us to understand how we might be able to effectively advance the strategies that are necessary for women uh, throughout the continuum. And so it is my extraordinary honor uh, to introduce to you, uh, and I'd like, uh, we don't have the name plates, uh, so when I mention your name, if you just kind of let everyone know who I'm actually talking to and uh, talking about. Um, but first and foremost, uh, Mocha Nisik, uh, is a project manager and researcher at the University of Derby um, in the UK and has been actively involved in national and international drug policy and the recovery field over the past decades. She is a criminologist, criminologist and a PhD candidate in social justice and works uh, also as an international relations officer at a recovery organization, Celebrate Recovery from Boston and as a Secretary General of the Recovered Users Network, or RUN, she, um, her, her current research explores lived experiences of people in recovery in nine countries across Europe and focuses on the role of recovery capital and stigma in the recovery process of women. We, she will be followed by Asya Ashra from Pakistan, who held a master's in applied psychology from Punjab University. She did a one-year fellowship in substance abuse education treatment policy and prevention from the Virginia Commonwealth, of Univer uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in the USA. Uh, that's where she and I was able to meet each other for the very first time. Um, uh, she is also a global uh, a demand um, reduction trainer, DDR trainer, and national trainer for the universal treatment curriculum um, of the UNODC and Colombo Plan, and is internationally certified, uh, an internationally certified addiction professional from ICCE in Sri Lanka. She also is a member of the Asia Pacific Working Group for the VNGOC 
and a core member of the gender working group of the World Federation Against Drugs to specifically address the drug addiction among women, gender-based violence, and its correlation with illicit drug use uh, and uh, access to healthcare treatment, recovery, and services of which she will be followed by Chantel. And Chantel Lincoln is the program director for the Drug Free America Foundation, where she analyzes research to develop resources, educate on the harms of substance use and substance related trends, design social media campaigns, mentoring youth, and assist in the organizing of events and trainings. She's earned both her master's of public health in epidemiology and global community communicable diseases, and a Bachelor's of Science in Biomedical Sciences from the University of South Florida. Prior to join, joining uh, Drug Free America Foundation, Ms. Lincoln worked uh, as a property management field in the property management field for 10 years and then completed an internship uh, with the Florida Department of Health. And bringing up and making sure that we are able to end in a soaring way. Um, my dear, dear friend, um, Cressida. Cressida uh, De DeWitt. No, <clears throat> pronounce that best. Pronounce that no, 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 pronounce it for De Vita. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, with a Master's of Global Studies in Gothenburg, Sweden, after graduating, uh, she joined the World Federation Against Drugs as a communication manager and junior project officer. In her role, she has organized various international conferences and webinars and is part of the Gender Working Group, has conducted a joint preliminary study on accessible treatment for children in Kerala, India, and co-written a joint position paper on the need for gender sensitization uh, and prevention treatment, rehabilitation, and recovery. It is my extraordinary privilege and pleasure to introduce you to these remarkable leaders uh, in our field and to have us begin this conversation. Are we ready for the video? Yes. We want to start with the video and then we will start with Mona. Thank you.
Perfect. Thank you very much. And then we'll provide some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlton. And it's always a pleasure to be introduced by you. And you set such a high measure for all of us. You know, I'm not nervous to achieve everything, but so if I get carried away, just cut me. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to share a presentation. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. And I promised I'm not going to take 18 minutes, like 18 slides. So okay. I'll be very short. <laughs> Uh, and um, yeah, so first of all, um, all of the recovery field and everything that I'm doing is very personal for me. I come from the family background of people with severe alcohol and drug use uh, problems and addiction, and some of them recovered and some of them didn't recover. And uh, so this is really personal for me. And I, I put a, a very famous quote for, from Julius Caesar, which said, experience is the teacher of all things. And I think from my point of view, it, it really is. And, uh, but also it kind of pushes us as a society, as researchers, as professionals to include the voices of lived experience into everything that we do. Next slide, please. So this slide is really uh, not what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, I, I really want to talk about recovery, recovery capital and how women recover. But in, on these events, we always get the question, what about people who use drugs who want to use recreationally? Uh, why don't you decriminalize or something like that? But from our point of view, from recovery point of view, we want to celebrate people who recover. We want to share these firing stories that we see every day. And we want to show that recovery brings many benefits to communities and society and families and children, and not only to those who recover. So uh, while I don't judge or shame anybody who is using drugs, especially if they don't have like consequences on, on families, I think it's very important to also speak about people who do recover and who have been there uh, in, in addiction. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so what is recovery? And consensus of meaning of recovery hasn't been uh, fully reached in years. There are many, many definitions of recovery, but kind of common themes are that it's around stopping or reducing drug use. It's about uh, having the control of, uh, of the drug problem, but it's also about positive changes and, and how recovery uh, improves the lives of people and increases um, uh, the participation in society. And this is really also important for people to have meaningful activities. And uh, while research showed us that almost 60% of people who pursue recovery do recover, uh, this this has been really something that that's not seen by professionals, especially in medicine in medical field. Psychiatrists do not see people in recovery. They only have contact with people in addiction, and that's why additional reason why we think it's very important to showcase the stories of recovery. And uh, so, uh, Betty Ford Institute consensus panel uh, uh, they they have this definition of recovery, but what they also did is they uh, kind of, uh, they say we have recovery is a process and there is early recovery, which is the first year of recovery, uh, maintained recovery and stable recovery, which is after five years of full remission. And this is really important because after five years, people um, reduce the risk of relapse from 70%, which is in the first year, to 14%, and that's uh, the percentage of general population's uh, risk for being uh, into addiction. So this is really important for us to know. And uh, the, the other thing which kind of differentiates between uh, men and women is that reasons for stopping and for staying stopped are not the same uh, across the genders. So next, next slide, please. And what, what is recovery capital and, and why is it important? So what we want in recovery field is uh, to bring uh, 
some kind of shift in the measurements because uh, it's uh, addiction or harm reduction uh, activists or, and researchers and ex experts measure all of these negative things. So re reduction in death, uh, reduction in, in um, infectious diseases and, and all, all those negative kind of consequences. But, but what we want to bring to the agenda and to the table is how do we measure recovery? What recovery brings? How, how can we achieve um, a better, better recovery, increase the numbers of people who recover? And uh, in our own, own work, we, we use these kind of three domains of recovery capital. And recovery capital actually is all of those resources that a person can kind of use from the community and, and personal resource, resources as well to achieve recovery. And uh, uh, while personal and social capital is something that, that's really important and, and it's about self-esteem, self-efficacy, networks, and like kind of pro-social uh, peers, uh, the community plays a critical role, especially if uh, the recovery community capital is not uh, kind of available in society and especially if stigma uh, is so strong as, as we saw on the video. So if if we also, next slide please, uh, if we also uh, look at stigma as a negative kind of recovery capital, then we have all of these domains of stigma that influence um, personal, social and community recovery capital. And it always starts with self stigma, which also fuels uh, social stigma because when a person acknowledges that you know, uh, being stigmatized is what he is, or if, if someone has been repeatedly addressed as useless, as someone some, someone bad, they, they kind of internalize it, but it also spreads across the membership uh, networks. So now the networks become stigmatized and uh, the, the community builds these kind of uh, structural barriers for people to recover. And it's really important to be addressed uh, not only by uh, individuals, but as us as a society. So next slide, please. Uh, yes. Uh, so what we have done to do to kind of uh, do a, a better job in in creating evidence uh, about recovery, we we have this uh, life and recovery survey that has been repeatedly done all over the world, and now it's being done in nine countries as part of my uh, research. And we want to quantify the, the lived experience of recovery and, and to examine gender differences, to, to challenge the exclusion and stigmatization by bringing these numbers uh, to the policy makers and, and to wider communities. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, while it's really important uh, to, to see what, what happens with people when they transition from addiction to recovery, there is also a big difference in, in a kind of recovery community capital and what's available in community for people to tap into. Because in some, while well, in some countries like UK and Netherlands, we have wide availability of 12 steps and peer-based uh, recovery support services in the Balkans, in other European countries, in Belgium, we don't have those resources. So people really uh, don't have that kind of support uh, available in, in our communities. And it's even worse for women. And we have these um, mixed uh, peer support groups, which, which are not suitable for women who, in, in many cases, have been victims of sexual violence or domestic violence, and they do not feel comfortable sharing their recovery stories and addiction stories uh, with uh, men. Next slide, please. And, and there are also uh, women sh uh, typically have shorter addiction careers compared to men. If you see this like around 16 years, uh, while men have 19.2 years, but actual time of problematic drug use is longer for, for women. And this also kind of suggests that it's concentrated uh, and the period of, of problematic drug use in their using careers are really concent concentrated 7.7 years, which is really, really long. Next slide, please. So 
So we also transferred some of these, uh, uh, some of this work into a new scale called uh, Strengths and Barriers Recovery Scale a few years ago. And it also showed us, if, if you if you see uh, the numbers, that uh, women had fewer strengths in addiction, but they had a greater level of strengths when they transition from addiction to recovery, which means that uh, recovery has huge benefits for, for women. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can skip this one. So uh, gender differences are huge and women are more likely to stay in steady employment, regain custody around uh, children and also further their education. But still uh, women have untreated emotional and mental health problems, which is really a great problem. And what also was shown here on the video is that there are many barriers to treatment and recovery for women. And as you see, many of the uh, treatment and recovery barriers are actually individual uh, uh, on that domain. And uh, the, the joint kind of common thing is stigma and the fear of losing children. And those are kind of the key points that we need to address when, uh, when we think about uh, female recovery. And uh, I'm not gonna, gonna get into all of this I'm so sorry. Stigma around addiction recovery is re really uh, plays a critical role uh, for women because it stops them from seeking help. It stops them from staying treatment and it has severe consequences on, on women in, uh, in addiction and recovery. And why all of this is important is that because acute services can get you to the pain point. It, they, they do get you, but it's recovery services that uh, kind of support and family and friends and communities that see you through the process. And we always uh, speak about recovery as a, uh, or addiction as a chronic relap relapsing disorder or disease, but actually we treat it as a, something acute, as you know, you, you broke a leg and we're just gonna mend you up and you know, you'll be fine but it's not how it goes. And we have all of these uh, beautiful uh, uh, recovery innovation around the world, but the joint thing for them is that they use kind of this notion of chime, which is um, uh, something that has been taken from the mental health area and it, it's promoting actually connections uh, and hope that changes the identity and, and also meaningful activities. And uh, while they do, this is done, uh, people feel empowered and they change the, the identity from using and user and an addict to, to a person in recovery. And we also have this amazing uh, new tool, which is called Photo Voice. And, and we have actually an uh, exhibition here. So I, I, I think it's good for everybody to see it and to, to read the stories of women in recovery. So in conclusion, I would say that a recovery is a, a process and not, not uh, yeah. events, and that it's rather rule and not uh, exception. But there are many pathways to recovery and women do have different uh, journeys in addiction and in recovery. And what really matters is that women are more likely to gain uh, ed education, employment, custody in chil uh, children when they're in recovery, and that we need to work uh, into translating all of the evidence around female recovery into the practice. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, it's an extraordinary presentation. Um, thank you for the work and the passion uh, that you bring to it. Uh, and uh, for exposing to us resources that we may not have been aware of, particularly around the specific issues uh, related to women in recovery. Uh, I personally thank you for that. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn now uh, to our good friend, Asia, uh, who will be able to prevent, uh, present to us um, uh, her perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Malkan. Thank you, Kanten. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And today I'm going to talk about bridging gaps Posting evidence-based treatment for women with substance use disorder. Uh, uh, I am from Pakistan, that is a beautiful map of my country, and it is situated in South Asia. And total population of uh, my country is around two, around 234 million, and women constitute around 114, uh, 140.8 million. And uh, next, this map is also very important. 
we share a long forest border with Afghanistan. And unfortunately, Pakistan is not only a transit corridor, but also a consumer of illicit Afghan drugs. So drug abuse is really a pandemic in my country. Yes. As per the UNODC survey in uh, 2013, there were around 6.7 million uh, illicit drug users, and the number of women was around 1.5 million, or 22% of the population. But uh, you understand, like unlike male, uh, female drug abuse is more a hidden activity, and then the culture like mine, it was not easy to get the exact number. So, and cannabis was the most uh, widely used drug generally. For the women, common drug of uh, choices were like tranquilizers, uh, sedatives, uh, amphetamine type stimulants, and uh, uh, and then the prescription painkillers. Currently, ICE is a huge pandemic in my country. And both uh, young girls and boys in educational institute, they're really, uh, they're, they're the number of uh, ICE abuse is really increasing a lot in my country. Next. And uh, why drug use among women in a country that is Islamic? It's, unfortunately, female drug abuse is underreported, under researched, and under studied. I could not uh, get a lot of research which I could share. Oh, this is like what? There were only a few leaflets and some journals. And uh, among them, uh, among in among the psychological factors, next slide, uh, conflicts with the husband that was a major factor. And next. Like, among economical factors, uh, unemployment and poverty was another factor for leading uh, female toward drug abuse. And among social factors, it was more unresolved conflicts, uh, matrimonial stress, and then like, like not having a, a, a recreational activity. And and now it's uh, women have a lot of roles like a caregiver, and, and now they are in uh, working area, so it puts a lot of pressure on them. In addition to that. Uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, trauma, and if the uh, a partner is using drugs, these are the main factors of drug abuse by women in my country. And we all know that trauma and addiction is like a very complicated, and it is a kind of in women, it is like a, they go together. And uh, I next, and then uh, Nicole uh, has worked a lot with the prostitution, and uh, these are very beautiful lines. Like imagine the trauma experienced by a woman who is raped. Now imagine the trauma for a woman who is essentially sexually assaulted over and over for years. We now know that's complex trauma. And that's what uh, survivors of the prostitutions are trying to overcome. They're really intense lines, so I, I always read them as they are. And as per NIDA, women use alcohol and drugs or both during their exploitation, 84%. 80% of women who were seeking treatment for substance use or addiction, they had a history of trauma. 74% uh, addicted women, they experience uh, sexual abuse. And next, gender-based violence is another that is alarmingly increasing in my country, particularly in the COVID pandemic. It has been risen to a higher level. And still, unfortunately, 50% of the women, they do not report it. They just suffer in silence. Next. And what are the challenges and barriers? Uh, Mulka has talked a lot, but I'll be just, just summarizing like what is the really barrier and challenge for women in my country. And there are a lot of like uh, mental risks, fear of losing children, and uh, repute, family repute, uh, constraint constraints, stigma, and um, lack of services. They're not like expert very much in my country, and most importantly, exploitation by the quacks and faith-based dealers. That is the, and an addiction is typically considered as a male problem. So these are the, because of these factors, female, they are reluctant to seek help. Next. Uh, Mulka talked about, uh, there are a lot of barriers in treatment, entry, and engagement. I will not go into the details, but they, these are like interpersonal, intrapersonal, social, cultural, and structural. I would just like to talk about one barrier that is structural and systematic. Unfortunately, treatment program in my country, they are not gender specific. They're, they're not uh, built as for the needs of the women. And mostly, if the women they are able to get treatment, it is mostly a mixed set of treatment. And that is very unfortunate. Next. And treatment strategies. Uh, next, please. And that is like uh, the place where I'm working. It's a Greenfield Hospital of Psych Psychiatry. And I'm very proud of this place. It is recently built around uh, one and a half year ago. And it is really indeed a state of art facility. And where we provide evidence-based ethical human, human treatment, which is culturally sensitive. And it, it is uh, as per the needs of the women. Next. And in 
and why we are successful in getting a lot of the women is like that because like we outreach we go to them they won't come to us like we go to them and it is very much important to see what are their needs and then what is their ambivalence regarding those urgent concerns and then after those like you link with them the healthcare providers so out we started from the outreach and we follow a continuum of care for women like from not into the treatment within the treatment having all the services and case management is very important aspect of our treatment because women have a complex needs and then ongoing recovery there is a recovery lounge and there are, it's keep ongoing what we have done for the women is there is a flexibility there is a flexibility of getting outpatient treatment there is a flexibility of, uh, flexibility in getting short term inpatient intensive outpatient and we are also thinking about if we could do a, a home detox uh, so, so it is really helping us to have a lot of women in the green field. So substance use and comorbidity among the women we treated 41% patients and substance use there were with only substance use disorder there were only 27% of the uh, population. Okay, next. And you can see the graph. Uh, we have a separate female unit ward and how the number of female uh, patient is increasing and why it is increasing. Next please. And you can see that it is not only the person, women with a substance use disorder, they are getting treatment, that women with the other uh, co-occurring medical and mental health disorders that are able to get treatment. Thanks. And there is a small experience sharing. Uh, uh, I would say like, uh, it, it is not like being a, um, uh, something exaggerating, but uh, this uh, experience is really helping us. I would just like to share the case of a uh, young girl who started uh, cannabis in the school, then she moved to the UK and she started using alcohol and uh, cannabis, and then she, later on she developed substance-induced mood disorder. She uh, admitted at the Greenfield uh, Hospital in 2022 for a, one month. She is working on recovery and it's online follow-up. And other women, like uh, she's 33 year, years old and uh, uh, she is an American, uh, married to a Pakistani at the age of 18 years, having two uh, uh, children and a lot of interpersonal conflicts because you can see because of the culture and age and, just, and, and typical Pathan culture that is very important. She admitted in the Greenfield Hospital with a history of cannabis abuse and PTSD. She took more time, around three months, but she is doing well and she is in recovery. Thanks. And why it is helping for us? Like, what if I could say, like, what are the three four things which are really helping a woman in my culture, and they're, they're they're creating flexibility for the family to let them get admitted? It's just like a qualified and trained professional. I'm a, I myself as a trainer and wise. That is a curriculum specifically related to the women environment. That is a recovery conducive environment, and mostly. Uh, we are shifting the paradigm from confrontational to motivational approaches. That has really helped us. So we are advocating, uh, advocating gender sensitive treatment at a local level and uh, uh, by DC, uh, that is the our twin network. I'm proud of that. And at the international level by being a part of a gender working group. Uh, part. Next. Next. So I'm going to conclude my presentation. The women needs gender responsive treatment. When I say that gender responsive treatment, it means that it should address the um, uh, unique experience of the women. It should cater to the complex needs of the women. Uh, it should be culturally responsive and it should be trauma informed. And most importantly, that is the key feature which we have seen that it should be a strength based, not a deficit focus. Thank you very much. Thank you so very, very much. I uh, often feel whenever I hear you speak, you're like taking me by the hand gently and giving me a wonderful tour of your country um, and the great remarkable work that you were doing. Um, so thank you so very, very much for that. And now we'll hear from Chantel, uh, who will provide her perspective. And thank you. Thank you, Malka and Asia and Carlton for sharing. So my name is Chantel. I'm from Drug Free America Foundation. I'm going to briefly discuss a prevention project we're working on. So our project was developed as we're seeing a sharp rise in marijuana use among pregnant women. The blue line is the rise in prevalence of self-reported use among pregnant women in the United States. And the red line is what we're seeing in our state. So you see that huge steep rise. So why the increase in marijuana use? So changing marijuana laws, increased access and availability has led to normalization of marijuana use and um, 
decreased perception of harm, and it's affecting a very vulnerable population, which is women and their future children. So we're seeing a rise in marijuana use, not only prior to, but also during and throughout pregnancy. You can see the, um, the rates of prevalence of marijuana use from 2002 compared to 2019. Next slide. So it's highly concerning as a scientific literature is the uh, documents of potential negative effect, effects on the developing fetus. And um, such effects are observed as when a child, a newborn born to a mother who's used during pregnancy, um, they're at increased risk of short-term um, premature delivery, stillborn, um, small participation with age. And those are all associated with negative health effects on the developing child. And such effects are also observed as a child enters school age. Uh, behavioral problems have been observed through longitudinal studies. Um, as a child develops as a teenager and into young adult, they're at increased risk of using marijuana themselves and also developing a substance use disorder. So we are um, aimed at marijuana and pregnancy with our project and how we're, what we're doing is we're targeting the individuals and organizations that have those relationships with the mothers, with the pregnant and new mothers. So what we're doing is um, our strategy is first to connect and develop with those organizations that are working on the ground in communities with these women. So we established a Florida neonatal marijuana exposure task force. Our project aims specifically for our state, which is Florida. So we've developed these relationships as we've connected with them, we've and um, referred to other organizations and really have developed this task force. So we meet virtually over Zoom every month. We engage in conversation. We send out a survey, find out what resources are needed, what's going on in the communities, what challenges and successes they face. And what we found is that really there's a lack of resources. They really don't have anything to provide for these women. There's really no conversation happening between the provider and um, the mother. There's misperceptions because it's legalized. They think that it's safe to use. They don't understand the potential effects on the child and on them. Um, they were using to treat self-medicate for mental health condition, to treat nausea and pregnancy-related um, morning sickness. And there's a lack of like social services for these women. Next slide. So we first started to develop new resources. Next slide. Um, and you can click again. So we developed um, resources in English, Spanish, and also we found out that there's a large um, need for resources developed in a Creole. So we've developed all of our resources and then translating into Creole. Our fast facts document is pretty much like an overview of what happens when you use marijuana and how it can travel through the placenta. And that can be used as a talking point guide for these organizations and providers to be in that conversation. Uh, we have an infographic that's like a mini sized poster that can be hung up in offices. It talks about the potential um, adverse effects throughout the child's life course. And then Delta-8, um, through the task force, we are seeing a lot of like Delta-8 in our gas stations, smoke shops, and there's a proliferation of products. So our task force informed us that there's been a large um, consumption and increase in their population. So that's why we have the Delta 8 and information of why are these available and what these products are. And we have a social media campaign. So there's a lot of obviously mis misinformation on the media. Through the media, it's shown beneficial. So we have a weekly social media campaign where we've taken um, facts from our resources and converted them in, into about 40 social media memes that we have on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook that's able to be disseminated, help um, counter those misperceptions and actually put the information out there that can help them. And we've created videos, one in English and one in Spanish. Um, short, it's like 60 to 90 seconds. And through these videos, next slide, we are doing a digital media campaign. So we've taken the videos and converted them into a couple like 15 second ads that are on Google, YouTube, it's running for 32 weeks. We're targeting women of childbearing age. And this media campaign is sending the viewers to our dedicated webpage where we're hosting all of our resources. Next slide. So we just started this campaign in November and we've already delivered almost 2 million impressions. We, next slide. We've generated almost 36,000 clicks to the webpage. So it just shows how much this information people are looking at it. They're, they're wanting to go back, find resources and find out more information. Another aspect we're doing is um, conducting regional town halls and lunch and learns. So we're, our state's divided into six sections. So it's important to go through into the communities, connect with the organizations. So we're partnering with the organizations within each region. Our lunch and learns um, organizations from throughout the region can come in, get educated by a subject matter expert, 
followed by like an open discussion and strategize, talk about what's going on in their communities, and we bring that back into their communities. And then um, the town hall is pretty much like community members come in, they hear from a panel, and then they can ask, ask questions and have that open discussion. Webinar series, we are educating through hosting webinar series with a different subject matter expert. Our first one was called fetal and neonatal marijuana exposure, speaking uh, for those unable to speak for themselves. We had a neonatal nurse practitioner give that, so she um, informed about the science behind marijuana use in pregnancy, the potential effects. And then she also is uh, incorporated her experience because she works in Colorado, one of the first states to legalize marijuana. And then our second webinar we just had last week was called Women in Weed by Dr. Letitia Bader. She's a clinical psychologist. She talked about the marketing aspects, the industries targeting toward women. She talked about the products available and the cannabis and parenting movement. So really informative. Um, they're only an hour long. I highly recommend that you view them. And they're on the website, which I'll show you in a minute. Online training course. It's important to educate the provider and the treatment and French and fresh professionals. So in the process of currently developing, developing that curriculum with subject matter experts and getting it certified. And then advocacy day, one way to make changes through policy. So every year we hold an advocacy day. We gather coalitions throughout our state. This year we had it last year and it was our largest group. We had about 50 youth. We broke out and we had about 150 in total, 50 youth. We broke out into 17 groups. So we had to um, reach a lot of legislators and we bring forward a couple topics and one of them was the Marijuana Pregnancy Project. So each group briefly educated the legislators talked about our project, educated on the issue, left our resources behind, and um, potential policy changes would be making sure that these dispensaries, because research is showing that the dispensaries are, um, the bud tenders working within the, within the dispensaries are um, advertising and recommending to pregnant women. So one strategy would be to making sure that that's not um, able to be done, and then maybe potentially putting like warning labels and signs within the dispensaries. In our dedicated web page, you can scan the QR code. Our actual website is dfaf.org, but we have a specific web page dedicated to this project where we're housing all the resources, um, the recording for the webinar series. And um, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for taking the time to come so. Thank you so very, very much for exposing us to extraordinary resources that are in high demand. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And Cressida, you have an amazing task ahead of you, but I know who you are, so I know what you're capable of. So I turn it over to you. I don't raise the expectations too much, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it in the five minutes that were assigned to me so we end in time. I'm honored to be here representing Gender Working Group, but not only alone. Actually, I have two amazing Gender Working Group members next to me and also in the room. So um, I'm going to present a bit about us and how we came along. Um, over the years, uh, gender-sensitive approaches in prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation and recovery have slowly gained more attention. Um, however, um, as we have heard, the lack in gender-sensitive research as well as, as barriers and stigma um, that are faced by women are still very much apparent and therefore in continuous need to be addressed. And therefore, against this background and talking about strategies today, um, the Gender Working Group, uh, the World Federation Against Drugs and the Congress of the World Federation Against Drugs has adopted a 10-year strategic plan in 2020 in which the Gender Working Group was initiated. And the Gender Working Group adheres to the United Nations Conventions on the Rights of the Child, the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as ACEDA, and the Istanbul Convention. And we consist of almost 20 representatives uh, from organizations around the world, including India, South Africa, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Sweden, Nepal, Pakistan, Nigeria, Kenya, and Italy. Next slide, please. Um, so we have a few objectives. And the re reason why we need the gender working group is because stigma, the barriers to treatment, discrimination, lack of treatment, uh, just gender disintegrated data, et cetera, is to this day still negatively influencing the lives of women. Um, and therefore we take stigmatization and discrimination faced by women in treatment and recovery um, close to our hearts. And we strongly advocate for an increase of research in gender sensitive approaches, uh, awareness raising, destigmatization, increased education and an overall change in the systematic approach towards women facing substance use disorders or are on the pathway of recovery. 
And we believe that treatment programs and professionals need to be equipped um, with tools and skills to meet the needs that are of women at all levels of their recovery journey to support and not undermine their recovery, including offering gender sensitive and trauma informed interventions. At the same time, we also strongly advocate for strengthening prevention and in integrating the gender differences and disintegrated um, data into that. Next. So to adhere to our set objectives, we have a few activities that we're trying to do. Um, we have been very active in producing statements, webinars, publications, strategies to promote gender sensitive, inclusive and evidence-based um, practices. Besides this, we're all also, okay, go back to the answers. Okay, yeah, um, So we also are very much part of regional world forums to always uh, push for inclusion of gender on the agenda. And the first activity that we, as I mentioned, are statements. So we produce statements on various international days throughout the year. And the latest one is, for example, the one in December 2022, uh, which was uh, statements throughout the 16 days of activism. Um, here we wanted to showcase every day the correlation between gender-based yeah. violence and the use of illicit drugs while highlighting different population groups and their specific needs. Um, we also publish every year on International Women's Day. This year, we, for example, kind of try to regenerate the product, uh, products and tools and materials that we have produced in previous years. We wanted to kind of showcase them again this year. Um, next slide. We also organized various webinars um, where we highlight the needs and ways for, forward in gender sensitive prevention, treatment, and recovery. And we also have organized a two-day capacity strengthening training for members of the WFAB, which provided information and tools on gender um, needs assessments. And all of the webinars are on our website. So you can always go back and use the web, uh, webinar recordings for your own information and the summaries included. Next slide, please. Um, we also have various publications on our website. And which are basically produced by ourselves uh, or in collaboration with other organizations. And these are basically evidence-based materials as well as tools, um, because these things are very much important in order to build a way forward and improve situations uh, for women. So each of the publications also include uh, infographics. So it's a bit of a summary of the full report and showcases more of an overview. So one of the publication is The Way Forward, which we organized or collaborated with Vianova International. Um, the second, and this one is more focusing on treatment. So it gives a few steps that need to be kind of integrated and kind of helps you to understand what is still missing and how you can approach it. Um, next slide, please. Uh, then we also have to uh, publications uh, which are focusing on one of them is focusing on uh, prevention tools um, and also the gender differences in substance use to develop the, uh, um, prevention interventions and this is an infographic of a very long <laughs> paper so you can always read on the website next slide the second one is focusing on gender specific treatment and recovery and also here it gives kind of an overview of what is happening and why there is a need and how to go forward uh, with it. Next slide, please. So to conclude, um, we have tried to increase awareness on the issues faced by women and promote gender-sensitive approaches in prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and recovery. And however, the work will have to continue um, as the barriers faced by women is still very much uh, there. And we will continue our activities and advocate for inclusion, uh, decrease of stigma, closing the treatment gap, gender sensitive prevention approaches, and so much more. So you're very much welcome to join us if you're interested uh, to join the gender working group. You can visit our website to read more information about it or find all the materials as shown on the screen, or you can just email us for more information in case you're interested or you just would like to receive some materials. So thank you so much. And because we are at time, I, we don't have the opportunity to express just how much uh, we appreciate 
uh, the great work that you all are doing and the wonderful presentations that we have. But if you wouldn't mind, give them one round of applause, please, for the remarkable presentations that we've had. Thank you very much. We thank our online audience and we look forward to everybody having your questions and meetings with us privately. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you.